Hello, I'm Hannah O'Connor. I'm 16 years old from Urbanstown. I'm a youth assembly member. Mark Durkin was a key member of the negotiating team of the Social Democratic and Labour Party. He went on to serve as the Minister for Finance and Personnel in the first executive and then Deputy First Minister. Please welcome Mark Durkin. Well, on a day of no prejudice, I can say that choir was as good as a dairy choir. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, the speaker for uh, having us here today and marking uh, the anniversary here uh, in Parliament Buildings, the home of the Assembly, which was one of the institutions uh, that was created by the Good Friday uh, Agreement. And I hope to see this institution working here and also hope to see Strand 2 and Strand 3 holding meetings in this building again as well uh, as elsewhere uh, as well. We have been reminded of people who were with us for achieving the Good Friday Agreement who are no longer with us and I don't want to recast their names again. We know we can't bring those people back. But we can bring back the spirit and the ethic that they put into achieving the agreement. That sense of collective purpose, that ability to cut through all the noise of difference and create shared institutions and shared uh, arrangements. The agreement was the result of multi-party negotiations. You wouldn't think that to look at some of the media treatment of uh, the anniversary. And it covered so many uh, facets here, not just institutional, but constitutional uh, as well. And I think one of the undervalued gems of the agreement were the changes in uh, the Irish Constitution, and particularly the new uh, Article 3. And I think in terms of the conversations that we're going to need to have in coming years, uh, around the different choices and preferences that people might have for the future constitutional status of this place. I think we could do well to begin by actually curating the language that Bertie Ahern and colleagues so carefully put in to the new uh, Article uh, 3, because it's framed in, in a way that is completely unthreatening to people of any uh, aspiration or uh, none. The agreement gave us a chance to move from what John Hume used to call the politics of the last atrocity to the politics of the next ambiguity. That was an achievement. But we needed to move from the sort of collective ambiguity that we deployed to get the agreement to create more collective certainty for each other. And that's maybe where we did uh, fall down when it came to the interpretation and implementation of the agreement. We didn't bring enough uh, collective certainty uh, into coinage alongside the necessary currency that collective ambiguity gave us in getting the uh, agreement and its endorsement. We also need to remember that the agreement wasn't just an achievement by all of the parties and the two governments and the independent chairs who were in castle buildings. It was also an achievement by the people, north and south. Because remember, the agreement was subject to endorsement, again, one of John Hume's ideas, but it was subject to endorsement by people north and south. So that by having a majority in Northern Ireland, it would be completely legitimate for unionists. And by having an overwhelming majority across the island as a whole, it would be completely legitimate for nationalists. And in all of the issues that we might carp about around performance under the agreement or the institutions being up and down uh, or coming or going, we need to remember that that agreement achieved the highest watermark of democratic endorsement of anything, of anything in the history of this island, north or south. And so that's why we need to cherish it. We need to value it. But we can't just treat it as a precious ornament uh, to uh, be admired. It is a toolkit that needs to be worked to meet our problems, whether they're social, economic, whether they're cultural opportunities or whether there are considerable environmental 
uh, challenges. We need to be working those institutions as a toolkit. And that includes using them to meet some of the challenges that have been thrown up uh, by Brexit, some of the strains for the institutions and some of the strains for our sectors that have been created by Brexit. We could look creatively and use a bit of lateral thinking around the structures of the agreement to answer some of those uh, problems. Hannah mentioned that I was Minister of Finance and Personnel and the first executive. And I used to enjoy the executive meetings, believe it or not, I did. Uh, I used to tell people that it was great. All of us got all together, got on well together in that first uh, executive. Everybody else used to laugh at my jokes, and I used to laugh at their bids. <laughs> but we did work through, and it was a difficult transition for people in all parties because we were very used to the politics of making demands, of making demands on each other, of making demands against each other. We had to get used to the politics of making decisions, making decisions with each other, and even making decisions for each other. And we saw that in that first executive, and we saw it in subsequent uh, executives uh, as well, where people did uh, extend uh, themselves in their different uh, briefs and in their different uh, portfolios, including uh, as First and Deputy First Minister uh, as well. And at a time when there's maybe some challenge or worry that some people might yet again try to challenge the agreement uh, at uh, this time, you know, let's remember that one of the things that really symbolised a unity of purpose was whenever uh, Peter Robinson and Martin McGuinness and the then Chief Constable stood together after there had been a very united uh, stand inside that assembly uh, in the face uh, of violence that some people were seeking to use against the agreement. So let's not underestimate the importance of the democratic symbolism uh, that we can have in these institutions if we can get them uh, restored and working uh, again. It is Good Friday. On Good Friday 25 years ago, Mo Molum sent word round the building that she had arranged for catering staff to bring in breakfast. I was the last of the SDLP ones down, and I came in along with David Irvine and some of the PUP into the canteen, and the SDLP table was near the railing leading to the serving area. And the announcement came from the serving area, there's no more bacon rolls, there's only toast. And I looked and I could see my SDLP colleagues all there with their bacon rolls. And I said, it's Good Friday. And their faces dropped. <laughs> the bacon rolls dropped. And David Irvine turned around to colleagues and says, typical, the takes can't have it for themselves, but they take the bite out of it so the prods can't get it. <laughs> when I got to the table with my lump bit of toast, they were all finishing off their bacon rolls. And Seamus Malm announced that he had declared that the traveller's dispensation applied. Uh, that there was, because he said, if we can't say we're on a big journey today, when can we say we're on a big journey? And I said, Seamus, who made you a lay bishop? And he said, well, if Paisley can ordain himself, surely I am entitled to a bit of equality under all this that we've negotiated. <laughs> So that was on uh, Good Friday. So there was good humour uh, in that building. Uh, there was a uh, good purpose. We need to renew that. We need to restore it. So let us mark today with a sense of positive renewal, but also allow time for some progressive review as to how we can learn the lessons of some of the failures and how we can catch up and deliver and let a new generation take things forward according to their lights, according to their priorities, and according to their shared purposes. Hello, I am Jessica Smacardle. I am 15 year years old from Fermanagh.